Hello and welcome to Factually. I'm Adam Conover. Thank you so much for joining me once again as I talk to an incredible expert about all the amazing things that they know that I don't know and that you might not know. Both of our minds are going to get blown together and we're going to have so much fun doing it. Now, this week on the show, we're talking about time. I often find myself obsessed with my time and how I use it. You know, I'll schedule meetings down to the minute. I'll try and fit as much as I possibly can into every single day because I know that time is a limited and precious resource. So I bend over backwards to make productive use of every last second. But of course, doing all this makes me absolutely miserable. On my deathbed, am I going to feel more peace because of the extra emails and lunch meetings I crammed into my calendar decades earlier? Or am I going to wish I spent a little bit more time relaxing and playing video games? (laughs) You know, it can't be the case that cramming as much work in as possible is the best and only use of my time. In fact, the truth is that looking at time this way through the lens of productivity as a finite resource that we have to use wisely, well, that's just one way of looking at time. In fact, the very idea that time is this objective, jointly shared resource is pretty new. In the past, humans experienced other forms of time. Before the modern era, farm life, the life most people lived, was regulated in large part by nature. The seasons decided what kind of work needed to be done. The amount of light decided how much work could be done. Weekends and happy hours didn't mean shit. Your time was managed by the field and the sun, not by the clock. Even sleep was very different until quite recently. (laughs) Every night was actually a two-act play. Across Europe, people would have something they called a first sleep that began around sunset. Then at midnight, they'd wake up to hang out, have sex, do chores, or just futz around before they went back to bed for their second sleep. Then they'd wake up at daybreak and begin the cycle known as biphasic sleep again. And this wasn't inherently better. I'm not suggesting you live this way, but it was a very different way to organize time. And guess what? If you wanted to do something at the same exact time as your friend in another town, well, there was no shared clock, so you just couldn't. Everyone, in a sense, operated according to their own clock. But all of that changed with the Industrial Revolution, which quantified, mechanized, and synchronized our use of time. In the factory, the clock operated the same all year, no matter what the season or where you were, and you better believe it was controlled by the boss. But it wasn't just workers who had to obey this new chronological master. Schools began to operate by regular hours, and women running households were urged to formalize their routines and set things like regular meal times for when the menfolk returned from the factory. Time, which used to serve us, started to control us. This capitalist notion of time is really a form of discipline. It makes time a servant of productivity. And though we've accepted it as normal, it's definitely not natural. So the next time you're feeling stressed out because that ticking clock is bearing down on you, remember, that is just one form of time. There are others. If we look on larger timescales, much larger, well, there's geologic time, there's natural time, and if we look inward at ourselves, at the biological rhythms that rule us, well, there's no question that your body follows its own timescale as well. And these are just the beginnings of different ways to think about time. Our guest today wrote an incredible and fascinating book on the topic. She's one of my favorite guests we've ever had on the show, and I'm so excited to have her back. Her name is Jenny O'Dell. She's an artist and an author, and she was a guest a couple years back to discuss her first book, How to Do Nothing. Her most recent book is called Saving Time, Discovering a Life Beyond the Clock. I'm so excited to have her back on the show. But before we get to the interview, I want to remind you that if you want to support this show, you can do so on Patreon. I am so grateful to the community of people who listen to this show and come back week after week. If you'd like to join them, head to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Just five bucks a month gets you every episode ad free. You can join our community discord. We would love to have you. And if you love stand up comedy, just a reminder that I am going on tour this year. If you live in Maryland, Rhode Island or St. Louis or anywhere else in the country, head to adamconover.net to find tickets and tour dates. I do a meet and greet after every show. I would love to see you there. And now without further ado, let's get to this interview with Jenny O'Dell. Jenny, thank you so much for being on the show again. Thanks for having me. You are one of my favorite guests we've ever had on this show. We've rerun 
the past episode that we did with you uh, in the past because it was just one of my favorites. I wanted people to hear it again. Please go back and listen to uh, that interview, folks, if you haven't heard it about Jenny's previous book, uh, How to Do Nothing. Uh, you have a new book out called Saving Time. What is this book about? Uh, it is. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I mean, no, it's OK. My my friend and I have this joke that it's like about like time, man, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like what is time? No, I mean, it is. I mean, it is about OK. It's about different ways of thinking about time, but it's there are a lot of books about that uh, mm-hmm. that are all, all very fascinating. Um, but I think mine is is more specifically motivated by like this very contemporary feeling of on the one hand, always feeling like you're racing against the clock, which is like a burnout feeling. Yep. But at the same time, feeling like you're living at the end of time <laughs> and uh-huh. how sort of demoralizing that feels. And so yeah. it's it's written. It's it's my attempt to kind of like write through that or like find some way of relating to time. Whether that's, you know, time is money, mortality, climate dread, like to like find some way of thinking about time in which it's not punishing. Yeah. The the fact that you mentioned that about the way it feels like we're living at the end of time, that is such a pervasive notion that I just heard people start saying around 2016, uh, coincidentally, yeah, yeah. people started saying, <laughs> people started saying, well, the world's ending. Well, what, you know, what are we going to, ah, we're all fucked. Ah, we're all going to, if there is another president ever, you know, like that, that (laughs) sort of thing, (laughs) this like this sort of bizarre apocalyptic thinking, you know, uh, uh, about, oh, we're living at the end of history. There's not going to be another generation after us, um, which to me seemed like a very distorted way to think because that's not the case. (laughs) There's nothing that's happening right now is is truly that different from you know really it's not like we're living through world war one or world war two you know where mm-hmm. uh, which were moments of huge historical rupture there are, is historical rupture happening now but it it's on a scale that you know has also happened in the last couple hundred years um yet there is this pervasive sense that it's all ending and it's all over uh and a, a lot of that obviously there's been political change in the united states it's also been the the pandemic has uh, was a big cause of that kind of thinking uh how did the pandemic change your notion of time uh i mean it was kind of interesting because i i wrote the proposal right before the pandemic started oh. which is i think a surprising to a lot of people because the proposal for the book yeah yeah so it's because it sounds like something that would have occurred to someone during the pandemic that time is weird. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so actually what happened was I had already thought about it a lot and I had written the proposal and I was, you know, about to start writing it and then the pandemic started. So, so the way that it affected it was it just, it honestly either like affirmed a lot of the questions that I was setting out to research anyway. Um, or it made things that I, was thinking about maybe abstractly feel more immediate to me, right? Like mm. I like one of the things that I had wanted to research was this notion of like abstract time, like time as like stuff that you buy, right? For example, or that you hoard or that you organize or you make more efficient mm. as opposed to like time just being things that happen like in an ecosystem or like in your body or whatnot. Um, and that's, a, you know, one of those is very in one of those scenarios, time is very like kind of interchangeable and yeah. empty. And the other one is very like concrete and full. And so I was already wanting to think about that. And then I was really struck personally by how, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, when there was kind of no end in sight, I like, I was like, Oh, like this is that sense of time where like all days are the same. Like you remember all those memes about like, Oh, it's the 47th of March. Like, yes. You know, right? Like there was this, this, um, because the, the kind of social structures around time were gone for a lot yeah. of people. A lot of the things that help us unconsciously mark time, like just Fridays, the existence of Fridays yeah. where, oh, there's happy hour that I'll go out do with my friends yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, that sort of stopped existing once we were all working from home. It's like, well, I mean, I'll work on Saturday too, or whatever. Like it was, right, right. I, I keep a, um, uh, a five year journal where every page has an entry for the same day for five years. So it's like January 1st, 
2018, January 1st, 2019, January 1st, 2020, Jan- mm. 21, 2022. And so I write a journal entry on that page. I recently completed my first of these and now I'm on to the second, my, my second five years. Every time I write a journal entry, I can see the previous entries from the previous year, which uh, previous yeah. years, which is part of my own way of sort of charting time. And when I started to get to, it was 2021 and 2022, I was looking back at the ones from 2020. All my entries are like, they're all the same. It's like woke up and did, had Zoom meetings, made dinner, played video game, went to sleep. Like all the days are blurring <laughs> together. I, yeah. what is time? Like I started to get really existentialist yeah, yeah, yeah. in my journal entries um, in a way that <laughs> I, I no longer am. It was like almost sort of, I had a sense of like weird vertigo, I think at the time. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think that's, um, I mean, that was kind of my experience as well. I mean, I, in my case, it's sort of weird because I was working on the book, but I was also teaching. Yeah. Um, and yeah, but I had my, you know, it was like, it was either I was on the computer or I was like going on the same walk um, around the same part of my neighborhood. Um, and there was also a weird part of the pandemic where the parks were closed around me. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah. you couldn't go into the parks. That was really, I was just going on kind of the same like circuit over and over again. Yeah. Um, and so I think for that reason, like I, yeah, I, it was just an opportunity for me to, to like be, be like inhabit that kind of sense of time and see how much it was tied to despair. Because like, mm. if, if all, if time is like, if all time is the same or it feels that way and, you know, thinking about that time, it's like, you see these like blocks of time stretching into the future. Um, I think in the book, I call it like, I was, I was ha- like just experiencing blocks of time in my box of a room, like day after day, like this uh-huh. kind of endlessness yeah. and repetition. Um, it makes it really hard to imagine a future that's different. Yeah. Like, or, or to imagine that like something might happen in a moment in the future that you can't anticipate necessarily right now, or you Mm -hmm. can't see. And it really lends itself to this, like the, the idea of like the foregone conclusion. Like I, it's like the sort of like, which I associate with climate dread. Like I, I know it's going to be bad. So I'm just going to give up (laughs) because, because I literally can't imagine it going any other way. Um, I can't imagine it going like differently. And, you know, for me, like those, that was also part of the pandemic experience. Cause like, you know, here in California, we had those fires in 2020, oh God, it was like yeah. September, 2020. And like the, the experience of actually watching the sky get darker between 10 and 11 AM here and being able to see like yep. my neighbor across the streets, like laptop as like she and I are both just c- continuing to work <laughs> through this disaster, yeah. you know? Um, you know, it's like hard. I, I think um, I, I think it helped me understand that a lot of the, this inability to think or, or unwillingness to think about the future, it just comes from being comes. It comes from like exhaustion. Like yeah. it's easier to just let it go. Yeah. It's like either blind optimism or blind pessimism are easier to inhabit than like something in between. Then, then what do you actually do to, to fix a situation or to make any progress in a situation like, it's yeah, it's a little bit easier to throw your hands up, but it's also natural when I remember that time. I mean, I remember being in it was, yeah, the late summer of 2020 being I, I've been stuck inside for, you know, four or five months now. Uh, there's an unprecedented civil unrest because of, you know, uh, against racial injustice and violence in America. There's cops beating people in downtown Los Angeles, arresting people, killing people. And also there's unprecedented forest fires and I cannot actually leave my home without wearing a mask, not just because of COVID, but also now because of like yeah. particulate smoke. Like if I'm outside for more than half an hour, I get a headache. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is the worst it could be. <laughs> is, uh, I mean, unless we were like, you know, actively, I don't know, being bombed by planes from the air, like, you know, being in London during the blitz or something that would be worse. But, uh, yeah. it, 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 I remember feeling this sense that I could succumb to despair in that way. And also this feeling of, you know, I'm a stand up comic. I like going out and doing shows. I'm doing that right now. Last night I got to go do a show, my favorite thing, you know, and ha- hang out with other stand up comics and make people laugh. And I remember being there going, I'm never going to do that again. 
Like I'm gonna, how, yeah. how could I? I'm gonna be stuck in my in my house. My I'm lucky to have a comfortable house with like good air filtration, <laughs> you know. So I'm I'm like yeah. not in direct danger. But um, you're right. It it narrows your narrows your possibilities. And so the experience of time that you're talking about there is you are contrasting abstract time with the experience of just one thing happening after another. So can we talk about that more? What do you what do you mean by those two ways of experiencing time? Yeah, I mean if you. Think about, um, I mean, one example, you know, because I live in the Bay Area and I grew up here. Um, uh, I mean, actually, so just side note, something that was kind of shocking to me was um, when I was reading about the like, colonization and time and the idea of the four seasons. Yeah. Like the fact that a lot of places don't have four seasons. Oh, my but, like, God. This, this is my favorite topic. Please go into this. Oh, OK. So, you know, like that's there are a lot of things that were exported from Europe time wise. Right. Like through colonization. And that's one of them is like. Yeah. Like one place's um, kind of scheme of seasons. Right. Being imposed onto places that have you know, not four seasons might have like 12 seasons or, you know, it depends on how you define a yeah. season. Right. Um, we, experience, and, we experienced this in Los Angeles um, because our notion of seasons came from, you know, the westwards expansion of, you know, white Europeans from east to west. Yeah. And if, you know, growing up where I lived in Long Island, yes, four seasons does make sense in that climate here in L.A. Right, right. People still say, oh, it's June. Summer started because yeah. we have that notion of seasons. But right now it is June and it is like 60 degrees out and cloudy and like a little drizzly <laughs> today because that's what. June is like in Los Angeles, it doesn't get hot until July and then it stays hot until like mid November here. And so if yeah. you're talking about just what is the hot season, that's what it is. Yeah. But we also don't really have a spring. We've got really a dry season and a wet season. And so yeah. flowers bloom around January because that's when the rains have come. Right. Uh, right, right. But we're applying these terms that don't, you know, just uh, that don't apply because People just like brought them over from New York. And as you say, they brought them over from uh, Europe before from from yeah. England yeah. and, and yeah. Holland before then or the Netherlands. I mean, yeah, <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and I think it's a it's a really good um, example of how language and framing will will change what you see and it, mm -hmm. or can make you insensitive to something that's actually happening. Right. Like like if someone is is has the framework of the four seasons, they might not be as liable to notice like those actual patterns that you're describing. Yeah. And then, and then for me, it was even worse. I, uh, there was, you know, there's this notion that the Bay area doesn't have seasons, which is yeah. like definitely a, a New York person thing to say. Right. But, um, it's, and it's like, and I grew up and I just completely internalized that to the point where I, I, in my childhood memory, there aren't really seasons. Like I don't, I was not paying attention to like the, these, obvious changes that are very obvious to me now, yeah. you know, like, I mean, like that's what also, are those changes? Um, like, the, so we have like our thing, our spring is kind of similar, right? Like it's, it starts really early. I mean, early, right. Compared to what mm -hmm. people consider spring, but, um, there's like, like there's definitely like waves of things that flower and it's very distinct. Right. Yeah. And you know, when it's starting, um, cause it starts really fast. Um, and then, you know, there's, it's followed by another wave, but it's like, they're, they're like the Douglas Iris is like this flower that I think of as showing up. Like it just shows up all of a sudden, like mm -hmm. early in the year when it starts raining. And like, so, um, you know, there's just, uh, there's, I don't know how many seasons w numerically we have, but, but that is, you know, to me, one example of, of time where obviously, not all time is the same. No moment is the same, especially during those parts of the year when things are changing really fast. Like I, in the book, I talk about that branch that I basically chose a branch of a tree to pay attention to pretty much for the entire pandemic um, uh. because I was walking past it all the time. And it's part of a California buckeye tree, which has these, when it does flower, it has these amazing like tall flower stalks. Um, and, you know, I, uh, I was just in Australia for three weeks and right before I left, I saw like the first little flower had opened on one of the stalks and I was like, oh no, I'm going to miss it. <laughs> like <laughs> I got so worried. I thought about it a lot while I was gone. I was like, is it going to be over by the time, you know, and it's like, and then I got back and it was like the whole tree had flowered. 
Like it's just wow. all flowers right now. And yeah. as I mentioned in the book, it's my favorite smell. But one of the reasons it's my favorite smell is because I have to wait for it. Uh -huh. And I think that that's, that's the other thing about this kind of sense of time is like, I think there's a lot about, um, there's a lot of our culture that's geared towards convenience and, and it, it can make you believe that, that what you want is to have anything you want whenever you want. That mm -hmm. so sounds good. Right. Like, yep. but it's actually, it, it like leads to meaninglessness yeah. in my opinion. Like the whole reason things ha are enjoyable a lot of the times because you have to wait for them and because they only happen in certain places in certain times. Yeah. And that's why I love, I love when there's really like niche festivals for things, you know, <laughs> like, um, like in way super Northern California, there's a marbled Godwit festival, which is like oh all gosh. this festival for like this one kind of bird yeah. that shows up, you know, this migratory bird. Yeah. Um, and it's like, people are just so excited, but you know, it's the same thing with like, pumpkins or like things that like you know it's like oh it's that time of year again we're excited you know yeah bird migrations are a wonderful example of this that uh you know i've, I've been bird watching for the last couple of years actually i i started bird watching around the time that i read your first book which also talked about yeah. bird watching as being a way to uh escape the attention economy and notice the world around you and and uh my own form of of meditation that isn't in an app. It's just, you know, I can, I, I can go out and get lost, uh, you know, in a little piece of nature and, and just like look at stuff for an hour or two is, is really restorative. Um, and I go down to the LA river, which is my favorite spot in LA. It's really, you know, it's like this, this dug out concrete channel, but there's a surprising amount of bird life there. I've probably seen like 50 different species of birds, um, on, in this channel next to the freeway. Um, and, the first year I was doing it, I was like, uh, oh, my God, there's I saw so many ducks. I saw a duck I haven't seen before. I saw a wood duck and I saw a widgeon. Oh, and my, I love wood ducks. The wood, I wanted to see a wood duck so, mu so much. I finally yeah, saw one. I was so amazing. excited. Yeah. They're so cool looking. They, yeah. if, guys, if you're listening to this, some, go Google it's image search. Google wood duck. Yeah. yeah. Look up. Look up a wood duck. They look like they look like little dolls or something. They're like so perfectly like painted. They're uh, also, they look like mallards, but like fancy. Yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah, a fancy yeah. little duck, but they're, yeah. but they are actually, everyone imagines the duck. You imagine a mallard. They are really the canonical American duck. They're the, they're the really yeah. duck lovers. No, the wood yeah. duck. It's their favorite duck. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. I, so I was saying that to a friend who also bird watches and she was like, oh yeah, it's duck season. It's winter. It's like, uh, you know, that's when we get ducks in, mm -hmm. in uh, around here. And now I know that about the area that I live in. People are like, there's no seasons in LA. People said about LA, LA too. Well, no, there's a duck season and there's also yeah. a hummingbird season where we have more hummingbirds. And, and, uh, th these are like other, this is a really, once you start looking for it, a really nourishing way to, to chart time because there's sort of always something happening that you can watch and, and look at. Uh, and it's really in contrast with this other form of time you're talking about abstract time. Time where uh, you, it, it's a commodity, it's a quantity that you're trying to save and you're trying to use as effectively as possible. And most of the time I feel myself trapped in that kind of thinking, you know, like yeah. literally I'll be walking down the street and be like, oh, wait, if I use this little trick, I can get across the street a little bit sooner and not have to wait for the for the walk sign and I'll have saved some time I can use on something else. And then I start thinking wait, if I do that a lot, I can like really save up some time as though I'm like saving money and putting it in an account <laughs> yeah. that's going to bear interest. Right. But yeah. I, 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 and then the way this is crazy. What am I going to use this for? Like, what, what am I, what, what am I saving? <laughs> so I, I, what is your relationship with that form of time? And do you find it's, it's uh, something that you, you feel you need to escape from as well? Yeah. I mean, I think anyone who's, you know, uh, I mean, that, that's just kind of like the, unfortunately like the dominant language of time i think yeah. for for a lot of people in a lot of places um and i think i think in the book i compare it to like you know if i turn on the tv like most of the channels will be in in english right it's like most of the ways that people talk about time are this really uh, you know historically specific but ubiquitous right. way of conceiving of time um that does i think take a lot of conscious effort to let go of um especially because it's not, it's not just you, right. It's like how other it's all around you. It's like how everyone talks about time. Um, yeah. 
So I guess, and I, I mean, I should also say like, it's a, it's, I try to think of it as like, there are times when you have to think about time that way. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I, I think, um, I think the problem is when you sort of internalize it and start to believe that that is actually what time is like, I've been really surprised at the resistance that you will get. If you just say really simple things like, like, you know, minutes and hours aren't real. Like, <laughs> like I right. feel like that's self-evident, you right. know, but, but like people will be like, what do you mean? Minute, it's minutes and hours. You know, it's like, well, what do no, you mean like, by that's, that? Yeah. What, that there aren't minutes and hours? Yeah. Uh, well, I, so, okay. Minutes and hours are a way of measuring time. Yeah. And they are, and again, I would compare them to a language. And I think the important thing for me that I kind of found in, in researching other ways of marking time and the history of how time has been measured is that obviously human beings have always needed to do that. Mm -hmm. Like time is important for us. Um, and you, we, we've needed to coordinate activities and, and time things like forever basically. Right. Um, but every system of marking time is, is kind of married to some kind of overarching goal, right? Mm -hmm. Like whether that's survival and like mutual flourishing or like capitalism. <laughs> uh -huh. And so, you know, like the, the, the whole notion of time that exists separately from natural cues where you can have something called an hour that exists yeah. like an hour here is an hour there and then the hour is this like unchanging kind of receptacle for something is not something that you get until people have the need or the desire to buy the labor time of other people it, right. like it it goes with that goal so like it's it's real insofar as like, yeah, we all live according to the system now. Like, I'm not denying that. I'm not saying that like you could suddenly wake up tomorrow and be like, I don't believe in minutes and hours. Like, I'm just going to do whatever. <laughs> but like, but it's also not true that minutes and hours have any are like the fundamental structure of time and are like the only way that time can be measured. I mean, again, I think yeah. this goes without saying, but but I just think sometimes like I've I've run into like how like deep seated that is yeah. and like the way people think about time. It's like, a collective, it it's a collective fiction that that way of looking at time that we all maintain because it's sometimes useful for us to, and it's especially useful for capitalism to, for us to maintain this version of time, but it's not, it, it's, we came up with it. We could change it. Uh, similar to money, right? When people point out, yeah. well, a, as a matter of fact, we made up money and yeah. it's not like a natural resource that some people naturally don't have enough of. We could, in fact, just collectively decide that everybody could have the same amount of money because we did, in fact, yeah. just make it up. Uh, and there's reasons that we don't, but we can acknowledge that it's a fiction and and time is the is the same way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was really struck by during the pandemic how precise my notion of time got. Like once I moved to zoom meetings everything being on zoom meetings it got so precise like i'd i'd just be sitting in front of my computer all day i have a zoom meeting at two and it would be 158 and i'd be like i got plenty of time before i gotta get into that zoom meeting because because <laughs> like i'm gonna log into that zoom meeting precisely at two and i know yeah. that everybody else on the other end because we're all stuck at home they're doing the same thing they're looking yeah. directly at it at the little clock in the right hand corner of their screen. Yeah, and yeah. if it says 159, they're not clicking that button yet. Right. And that was not how time operated for me, even in a work setting before that, when I was in an office, it's like people don't look at their watches that much. You know what I mean? And yeah, then you yeah, have, yeah. then you have to walk to the other person's office. Oh, I got to get a coffee. I got to use the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll be right there. You know, that kind of thing. But on zoom, yeah. it was like, we, we uh, this meeting is beginning at two o'clock. Exactly. Um, yeah. And it, so it's fascinating how technology changes our our sense of time, but also not just technology, the conditions of all being stuck, you know, at home in front of clocks, but also being on the clock and that we have a work product we need to make. In our case, it was a television show. In your case, it yeah. might be a, a a book that you're writing. Um, and yeah. that, there's a huge difference between that and like, you know, a couple hundred years ago, the way humans thought about time. Yeah. Also, you just made me realize that I feel like Frederick Taylor would have loved remote work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Taylor someone else has made that observation. Remi yeah. Remind us who he is. Okay. Uh, he, he was the founder of Taylorism, which is um, 
the sort of process of breaking up industrial work tasks into like very minute motions and also like, you know, designing workspaces so that, you know, like you reach the furthest distance to, to get something basically mm-hmm. like hy- hyper efficiency in the workplace. Um, like, I feel like a lot of people associate that with like the Charlie Chaplin, like assembly line. Yeah. Kind of like scene late from 19th modern century, times. early 20th century kind early of early 20th century. Yeah. 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 Um, it was part of like, a, I think a larger American kind of, um, there was efficiency was having a moment yep. in some kind of nefarious ways. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, but, but I, you know, it was all about, you know, reducing, um, any kind of unnecessary movement or time. Like, um, one of my favorite things actually that I cite in my own book is like, uh, it's from a a book on uh, scientific. So Taylorism was called scientific management. There was mm-hmm. also scientific office management where people were trying to apply this to office work. Mm. Um, and there was a, there is part of a scientific office management book where they were timing how long it takes to, to punch a time card. <laughs> and it's oh, broken God. into like six things. It's like identify card, like pick up card. And it's like, it's literally like <laughs> 0. 0.0158 seconds. And I'm like, okay, like, how did you <laughs> yeah what does identify card how is that measurable yeah <laughs> at, the, at that point how in long time? does it take like, you to find the card in the stack of cards that you yeah, would then but it's stamp like, the how card? do they know that someone's i don't know anyway i was just like it's so and the fact that it's a that they're timing punching a time card it's so meta anyway i yeah. love that um but anyway clearly he would have loved um remote work because it eliminates movement from the home to the office. Like, and as you said, <laughs> everyone is just like hyper aware of every last minute that they have before and, and during work. So, yep. yep. Yeah. And, and actually, I mean, that makes total sense. Cause in that same chapter that I talk about Taylorism, I, I, I talk about, um, like remote work surveillance and, mm-hmm. um, that company that is amazingly called staff cop. God. Another great, <laughs> <laughs> really? It's called Staff Cop? It's called Staff Cop, yeah. And, and this is a company, I assume, that sells products that allow you to uh, spy on your employees to see if they're working yeah. when they're remote working. Yeah. Measuring measuring productivity, which is yeah the same thing as measuring productivity and, and policing, basically, wrapped up into one one product. And this and Taylorism, by the way, is still being used on workers today. In fact, a yeah. lot of... Uh, Workers who are engaged in labor struggles like the railroad workers earlier this year, their their complaint is scheduling. It's that mm-hmm. they have been scheduled to within, in, within an inch of their lives, that it has gotten so efficient and so precise that, A, they can't have normal lives anymore because they're constantly they're being asked to work crazy hours or they're not getting enough hours in the cases of some other workers. Um, but also, the, it's gotten so efficient that if one person misses a shift or calls in sick, they're, they're actually not allowed to do that because of the whole system breaks down. Uh, yeah. And that sort of like a, a focus on using time as efficiently as possible has made like our society really, really brittle in, brittle, in a lot of yeah. ways. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but what really strikes me is that, that that Taylorism idea has infected people's own way of thinking about time. When I think about how many blogs I have read and how many books I have read about productivity, about improving your own productivity with people who, you know, share their, here's how I track every minute of my day to make sure that I'm as productive as possible. You know, and I, I log it all. And at the end of the day, I review it and I look for the, you know, this, you know, uh, inefficiencies in my process. It is, it, it seems like it's a sickness that we have internalized. Yeah. And I, I was surprised to find how early on that started mm. like so around the same time that they were timing the 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 punching the time cards um there was this amazing amazingly bad <laughs> i lo- i really <laughs> like things that are so bad they're good um so when i say i like this book that's what i mean um this book called increasing personal efficiency mm. But it, yeah, it's literally like it's written by the psychologist who is so obsessed with Taylorism that he like wants to apply it. Like he's like, why not? Why stop at the factory? Right. <laughs> um, and it's like, you know, tips for thinking more efficiently. Um, he has speed reading tests in mm-hmm. the book um, and he has a super unscientific map of efficient weather zones. Like, play, yeah. What are, um, what are, and then, 
What does that mean? Um, if it, it's like places where people like think more efficiently. <laughs> uh, because of the and then, weather? And then he, yeah, and yeah, because of the weather. And then he has like a little side note that's like, note that the best universities are all in the high efficiency weather belt. <laughs> I mean, but, I hear, <laughs> but that, like, I hear that today in that literally I've read studies about how poor air quality reduces productivity because it makes you think more slowly and you'll get less work done. Of course, it more importantly affects your health if you have poor air quality. But I've literally seen that about office settings that you should buy purifiers for your office because it'll make people work more efficiently. Yeah, right. The reasoning is interesting there. It's like, well, as opposed to health. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, But yeah, so that um, I, I, I looked at that book and then I also looked at this amazing magazine called Physical Culture, which was basically like a blend of bodybuilding. Um, what do you call it? Uh, what do you call it when it's like, um, it's like success gospel. What, uh, oh, prosperity, prosperity, prosperity gospel. gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Gospel? Yeah. Um, and like eugenics, <laughs> basically like all <laughs> like wrapped into one convenient package, um, where it's like, like I found, uh, they were really into, um, like this idea of strategic marriage, right? Like, mm-hmm. like, genetically strategic marriage and there was this one article about genes that was also very unscientific and it was like it was describing the genes themselves as workers like it was oh like God. this gene works as a like there's and it had a little illustration of them you know like as like workmen and it's like wow was, these people really believed that it was like work all the way down yeah um and that like we are just like working like the goal of life is to become an efficiently working machine yeah. Um, and so it was just interesting to see those early examples because it gives more context to that um, category of content creators that I refer to as productivity bros. Uh huh. Um, who are talking about like crushing your morning and cr- like crushing all kinds of things. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, because it's like you it, you see this like longer lineage of like where this language comes from and where that kind of like self punishing rhetoric also comes from because. Mm. It's like, this makes a lot of sense if you think about it as like, you are both the factory owner and the factory yep. worker now. Yep. And, you, but you, and you've taken that relationship and now you just have it with yourself. Yeah. I, I sometimes envision myself, because I, I do this to myself. I push myself way too hard. I'm doing the, 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 the new hour of standup. I'm touring is largely about this. It's about me pushing myself uh, to, to build the career in comedy that I've built, but I've also made myself miserable. And I often envision myself standing over myself with a whip, just being like, go, go, you piece of shit. (laughs) You know, Uh, that's, that's how I kind of talk to myself. What are you doing? You can't play video games. No. Why would you do that? You have emails you need to reply to. And then if you, once you're done with all the emails, no, now there's other shit you should do. You, you need to get ahead of that other project. Go open your to-do list. What if you knocked off a couple more things, then you'd be able to get more done like all your heroes, you know? And it's, it's like, it's, it, it, it's, it infects you and it's toxic to, to treat yourself that way. Uh, yeah. 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 That's so real. <laughs> <laughs> do you do that to yourself? I mean, you're as someone who, who wrote a book about this very topic, did you f- sometimes find yourself tr- cause you get a lot done. I mean, you're a teacher, you're an artist, yeah. you're also a writer. Uh, you're, you're very productive, Jenny. Are you, but are, it looks are you, that way. are you toxically productive or? No, I think I like, I mean, I, it's like, I, it's as hard for me as it is for anyone else, but yeah. I, and I, you know, I feel like, uh, I, I have my good times and bad times, but, but I, at least I, I feel like the, what, the thing that I, that has changed for me, like since I wrote how to do nothing is like, it is at least always a question for me. That's like hovering in the back. Like, am I, am I doing that thing again? Yeah. You know? Um, and I, I've been thinking so much lately about, um, something that I talk about at the end of how did you do nothing, which is do nothing farming that, um, mm. that method that this Japanese farmer came up with for rice farming that looks from the outside, like, um, it, it, I mean, it, it requires less labor, um, like fewer inputs, um, like no, no chemical fertilizer, all the stuff that looks like it would, it would make no sense, but then his rice farm ends up being more productive than everyone else's. And mm. it, it, it actually allows him to even like 
create farmable area out of like previously unfarmable area. Anyway, it's very productive in that sense. But if you if you read his book, he has such a he's he has a sense of humor that comes from someone who has a lot of humility, you mm-hmm. know, and he's like, I I had to mess up so many times basically to like get to this place. And and it becomes clear that that method is all about um, observation and respect for the processes that already happen in an ecosystem. So it only works because he really understands like the relationships between like the insects and the birds and the plants uh. and, and like, and at, because of that, he can do things at the right time in the right way. But he yeah. never, he never uses the language of like making something do what you want it to do. Like it's, yeah. it's more like, I'm just kind of, like any good gardener will talk this way, right? They're like, I'm just kind of here to kind of try to shape the way things are going. But like, I oh. know that it could all go wrong tomorrow and that it's not all completely under my control and like, nor would I want it to be because like in order for it to flourish, like I need to rely on processes that are exist outside of me. Right. Yeah. Um, and so like, I, that is like the attitude that I try to have towards myself, which is like, okay, I have some kind of capacity to observe things or write things or whatever. Um, but just like any landscape or ecosystem, like you can really mess that up. Like you, like if you try to do the industrial farming thing to yourself, right? Yes. Like you, like, yeah, you can just like we've actually done in this country, right? Like you can get a certain amount of time out of that and then, and then you've exhausted the soil and then you're just screwed. I, I love that so much. Uh, it, it actually, a, a friend of mine, who's a, a uh, fellow TV writer told me that that's what she does is she she knows how she works best. She observes herself and figures out here's when I do my best work and then allows that to happen rather than push, 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 saying, wait, hold on a second. When I push in this way, then I don't get the output that I need. I need to build in this time to rest or whatever. And, you know, this is this is how the process actually works, you know, um, like it's maybe me noticing like, yeah, I need to like get high and walk around <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. or whatever, whatever. Yeah. Like that's part of, that's part of my process rather than constantly, you know, beating myself to continue pushing. Um, but look, we have to take a really quick break. Uh, we'll be right back. Spend a lot more time with Jenny Odell right after this. You know, one of the most frustrating parts of modern life is when you realize that you are paying for a service you are not using. Like I signed up for yoga classes at a studio near my house And I didn't realize until a year later that I was being charged a monthly fee for classes I was not using. And, you know, that didn't really put me in a very, uh, you know, meditative state of mind. It seems like nearly all of these convenient free trials are built to give you exactly enough time to try the product before forgetting about the monthly subscription fee entirely. And we've all been there, right? In fact, over 80% of people have subscriptions that they have forgotten about. Well, guess what? You can end that today. It's time to take control of your spending. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. It can help you automatically categorize your expenses so you can easily track your budget in real time and get alerted if anything looks off. It is that easy. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, and they say that the average Rocket Money user saves up to $720 a year. So. Stop throwing your money away, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash factually. That's rocketmoney.com slash factually. You want me to say it a third time? I will. Rocketmoney.com slash factually. Hey, everybody, if you love stand-up comedy, I just want to remind you that I am going on tour this year. I'm headed to Buffalo, St. Louis, Baltimore, Providence, Rhode Island, and many more. If you want to see my brand new hour of stand-up, head to adamconover.net to get tickets. And if you want to support this show, head to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Five bucks a month gets you every episode of this podcast ad free. We have a community discord. We even do a live book club where we read a recent nonfiction book and discuss it over Zoom. It is so much fun. Hope to see you there. Patreon.com slash Adam Conover and adamconover.net for tickets and tour dates. Okay, we're back with Jenny O'Dell. We've just been talking about this horrible productivity focused way of thinking about time where we subdivide our own time and we try to get as much done as possible and we try to like sync up with people exactly on the dot and all this sort of thing. Sometimes that kind of time scale is necessary to get certain things done. You have to think that way to have a Zoom meeting. But what are some other time scales that we could be thinking about that and and what do we lose when we ignore those time scales? Uh I mean I think you 
it's almost funny. Like you could almost just look at anything else other than the clock, right? Like either <laughs> inward or outward. Like I, um, I mean, yeah, like I, because I was just overseas um, experiencing jet lag, I was very aware of the ways in which like you, you literally embody time, like yeah. time it's in your own rhythms. Um, and you know, when you're, you know, when they're disrupted, um, but also looking outward, you know, not just seasons, but things that change throughout the day. I mean, I mentioned in the middle of the book during, during that part of the pandemic where time felt really like it was at a standstill or it wasn't changing that I, um, like I put a camera on a tripod and pointed it out my window at the sky and was just taking, you know, between like various tasks, I would just like take a photo um, and scroll through them later just to kind of like convince myself that time was moving <laughs> forward um, because the sky, I mean, depending on what time of year it is, but that, you know, that was in March, right? March, April, right? The sky was very dramatic. So like there, there were a lot of clouds. It was constantly changing. The shadows were changing, right? Um, so I don't know, like, I mean, I, in the book, I do talk about like geological time as well, like these much, much longer time scales. But I think like what's more important to me than any particular time scale, because, you know, sometimes people will say things like, oh, geo geological time is helpful for realizing how like insignificant we are, right. which is like, I, which is true and is nice to think about sometimes. But, but I think what's more useful to me, like what I think about when I go to the the beach that I describe in the middle of the book is more just the sense of time as being active mm -hmm. and dynamic and having change in it. Um, like change, unpredictability, um, being able to recognize the agency of, of everything, right. <laughs> like outside of the mm. human world. Um, that, that, that is what feels like useful to me, like as a counter to this feeling that I think really goes hand in hand with abstract time, both on a daily and a kind of historical level, which is like this idea of that humans are like working machines and we live on a world that is inert and doesn't speak back to us at all. Ah, uh, yeah. I, uh, I, 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 what I love about geological time, what I love about talking to geologists, by the way, I've never had a geologist on this show. I should, because I love talking to geologists. And yeah. They're, they're so great. Yeah. <laughs> they're like very, they're very chill, cool people. Gen There's probably some stressed out geologists, but you know, I've, <laughs> I find the perspective they have is they're like, Everything is changing all the time so much. You know, you look at like mountains are like evidence of change. You know, every every spot on the earth is transforming itself at every moment. And that is what it is to study geology. And yet I don't see any of it in real time. You know, I as a person yeah. like since the since the invention of geology as a as a study in what uh, the the 19th century I believe or late mm -hmm. uh, late 18th century maybe um or thereabout like not much has happened geologically <laughs> in that very short period <laughs> yeah. of time yet it's the study of like huge amounts of change that are that are happening all around us uh and that's th that like gulf between the observed change and like the moment to moment experience of being alive is so cool. Yeah, for sure. And I also think there's things that are, that are somewhere closer to the middle. Like, um, I, there's a book that just came out here in Oakland called deep Oakland by Andrew Alden. Who's, um, awesome geologist who I, uh, really leaned on for the parts of my book that are about rocks because I am not a <laughs> geology expert. Um, so thanks to him, but, uh, he, he's had a, he's had this blog called Oakland geology for like more than 15 years. And it's just like an old, it's like how a blog should be, you know, it's like an old school, like it's just very consistent. And like there's yeah. a lot of comments, like people are really like engaged with oh, these articles. Um, but I, I've read all, you know, all of the ones that are about my neighborhood and the kind of the places that I go hiking, like in the Hills. And um, I've actually been surprised at how, there are some things that are observable, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, if you think about like erosion, um, obviously there's a difference between like uh, a huge amount of erosion over a long period of time and like a little bit of a cliff that fell off like in the last storm, but mm -hmm. they are related. They, those are part of the same process. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I was really fascinated with the parts of 
John McPhee's book, um, Control of Nature, that I quote in my book about the San Gabriel Mountains, which I'm sure you're more familiar with than I am. But, yeah, in Los Angeles, um, yeah. Yeah, but those that those are very sort of geologically young and very active mountains. Oh. And they're so they're so steep that like rocks actually kind of can't hold on <laughs> like all the way. So there's just constant, there's just constant landslides. Yeah. Um, and some of the descriptions in that part of that book are like, you know, he talks about um, the debris flows that will happen, like, you know, during a winter storm, if there's been like a fire the summer before. And like, he describes this family that like looks out the window, basically sees this dark mass coming towards them. And then their house fills up with rocks in like six minutes, <laughs> you know, like, um, this really and happened. That's like, yeah. Yeah. They Holy were, they, they lived, they were, yeah, fine. Okay. um, but, but like there's, there's a lot about that occurrence that is, that complicates, I think the idea of like a short, short term and long term, because obviously six minutes, their house fills up with rocks. That's very short. Yeah. The debris flow probably, I don't know that must've been like maybe a couple evenings or something like that but then as he goes on to describe like those happen in the winter after a summer where there was a fire a, a certain type of fire followed by a certain amount of rain right so he he also talks about one summer there was a fire the city officials kind of like went around to these neighborhoods that are right up against the mountains and told them you know there was this fire you might want to be aware this coming winter there might be this debris flow and and no one no one does anything. And then sure mm. enough, there's a debris flow, right? Like, yeah. so then, so then there's a the question of like, well, did that debris, debris flow happen when the rocks started coming down the hill or when it started raining or when there was a fire or when there started to be enough like brush for the fire? Like, you know what I mean? And then you could just keep going back right. forever. So it kind of like, it, it's like this interesting question of like, what is an event? Like what, what are the <laughs> bounds of an event? Right. You know? Yeah, I, I mean, we tend to neglect the other timescales that we are present for, I think, is the recurring theme here. Uh, you one of the things that really stuck with me about how to do nothing. And by the way, people, please read how to do nothing in addition to Jenny's new book, Saving Time. <laughs> but uh, you talk about how no matter where you are, there's features of the natural landscape you're in that no matter how much we pave it over are still going to be there. You talk about watersheds and rivers. That, you know, watersheds are such features of the natural environment that rain falls, water flows in a particular direction, it collects and forms a river. And most of the time, all we do is we cover it up or we channel it. We don't, we can't really eradicate it. We're still subject to water flowing downhill and flowing its way to the sea. We still live in the middle of that system. And I, I feel that time is very similar, that we still are present for these other timescales, whether or not we choose to acknowledge them. Uh, I read an article a couple of years ago. Uh, I believe this might've been an earther, the climate focused blog, but the journalist who wrote this, and I apologize for not remembering their name. They wrote about how Barack Obama had recently purchased a home on Martha's vineyard, uh, which is mm -hmm. his favorite spot on earth. Of course he can purchase a home there. Uh, but if you look at the climate change maps published by the U S government, the place where he bought the home is predicted to be subject to sea level rise within, you know, the next decade or two. Uh, mm -hmm. And that will, you know, eradicate the value of the home if it's even still livable. It's in a, you know, climate prone area. And this article pointed out if even the, if, you know, Barack Obama must know <laughs> more about climate change than almost anyone else on the planet being a, you know, Democratic president who is very well informed and reads a binder of documents every single weekend. And yet he made a pretty elemental mistake of of ignoring what is going to happen to this piece of property he purchased over the next couple of decades. If even he made this mistake, what hope do the rest of us have, basically? <laughs> um, or, or he pointed out a fundamental problem that we have of thinking on the scale of climate change. So let's bring it into that. I mean, how how can different perspectives of on time help us think differently about you know, the ecological crisis that we're, that we're slowly rolling into. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's a really, um, kind of understandable like reaction to that. That's part of that inability to think about the future where it's, it's like your mind kind of like turns away mm -hmm. from even imagining how you might respond to something. Like I'm, I'm thinking about, um, there's like a little detail that I, uh, site in the book where in Pacifica, which is um, next to San Francisco, and it's like a city that is right on the cliffs, has a lot of has already had a lot of problems 
with erosion. Um, and there's already like you can go there and see like condemned houses or like lots where there used to be a building. Um, there there were some basically meeting minutes that I saw where people were debating people who live in the town were debating like what to do about like the seawall failing basically that's Mm -hmm. in the main part of the town and some people were arguing for uh restored uh shoreline there's also like managed retreat right and then there's like there was one comment that was like i don't want any of that i just want a seawall that works for 50 years and like that number was so interesting to me. Like it's like uh-huh. 50 years. Like, is that how long you think you're going to like? Yeah, they're uh, they're about 45 and they're like <laughs> yeah, they're 50 doing the math. Years yeah. is enough. That'll be that'll be plenty. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it's like and I but like I think that's kind of a pretty common like sort of that's an extreme yeah. example of like a common like thing that people run up against um where it's like well if i can't have it the way that i'm used to it being or that i want it to be then i don't want to imagine anything else or i can't imagine anything else yeah um and so uh i think again that's that's one of those places where it's so important to not see time as this like linear foregone conclusion type of thing. Um, like I, in the book, I compare it to trying to imagine having a conversation with someone before you've actually had it. Like it's never Uh going to be, it's never going to be, obviously it won't be accurate because the the person's not there, but you're, you, the other thing that you're getting wrong is like you, you yourself will be changing throughout the conversation. Uh. Like, so, so even you, like you, the day before you're always going to be imagining it standing from where you are at that particular moment, having not progressed any amount into the conversation. Yeah. Right. Um, which is why when you have a good one, like you always end up somewhere that you didn't expect. And that has so much to do with the other person. And I feel the same way about time where it's like, you, like it's, it's, it is possible to hold in your mind the fact that like things, certain things we know will get worse and hard mm-hmm. and more difficult, but that's not the same thing as knowing what's going to happen. And it's definitely not the same thing as knowing or rather knowing that you don't know what is possible not so much, I think, for one individual to do like yourself, but what is possible between you and other people and what other people will make possible for you and then what you will make possible for other people and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So this is bringing us back to that uh, apocalyptic worldview we talked about at the beginning that people think, well, there's nothing we can do. The world is ending. No, I can't imagine today any amount of effort uh, causing a difference with this crisis that you know, I saw a scary YouTube documentary about or whatever. Um, But we're ignoring the fact that if we make the effort, we will already be in a different condition than we are when we're imagining it today. (laughs) And new possibilities (laughs) will arise. We will be different people. It'll be a different time. And we can't predict how we will be changed or how the world will be changed. Is that sort of the point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I also, um, in in the the chapter where I talk specifically about um, despair and kind of climate dread, I ask the reader to do this thought experiment in which you imagine that you weren't born at the wrong time, that you were born at the exact right time. Yeah. Um, And like, how does that change how you feel about the present and about the future? Because I think, you know, like I'm someone, I'm in my late thirties. Like I, I grew up, you know, in elementary school, they were already talking about climate change, right? Like I think there are some of us who grew up thinking like, feeling like you were born in the wrong time or like, like you, you came you were at the end of the party or something. I don't know. Like yeah. just kind of like, like th- things were already going downhill by the time you were old enough to understand that. Yeah. Um, and, and there's like a feeling of like, of just frustration, like, which is warranted, right? Like it shouldn't have been this way, but, yeah. but I think like there's in addition to frustration, there's also this possible feeling of like, well, I was born at the time that I was born maybe actually maybe it turns out that i find like purpose and meaning in through responding to this moment yeah i mean at any moment there are things that are dying and there are things that are ending and doors that are closing and at the same moment there are new things being born there's new shoots shoots growing up there's new doors opening in other directions and it's sort of your opportunity you always have to go find those you know i i think a lot of, even just what I do in media, right? Sometimes I think oh, I missed the boat. You know, I missed the boat on YouTube or whatever it was. Something, you know, there was some big trend that if I had gotten onto it early, right, I could have 
I could have hopped on and had a lot of success. I'm like, but there's always new shit that I can hop on now. So the lesson is find the new thing, right? And yeah. and hop on that or create the new thing yourself. Um, there's always a new frontier, which has colonialist implications, which are uh, <laughs> uh, very, very relevant for this conversation. But uh, there's always a new there's always a new frontier. There's always new work to be done. There's always something new happening. Um, and there's always change that can be made. It's sort of it, it is a it is a difference of mindset to some degree. Um, yeah. And I think not just mindset, but also like perception and observation. Like if you. I mean, this is an odd example, but if you think about like even just personally, right, like if you were if you're in some kind of situation that is really stressful for some reason, right? Like, like you, you're like really angry or I don't know, like some, something bad is happening. Like you're like, you're not perceiving. There's so many things about the situation that you're not perceiving because you're, it's all framed like through that emotion, right? Yeah. Like when you think about it later, your memory, your memory will be totally distorted and it'll be like missing a lot of details. Um, and so I think there's like, I, I think that that's maybe something that actually both of my books have in common, which is that I put a really big emphasis on um, like the, a pause that's long enough for you to consider that you, maybe you haven't seen everything about a situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and because that will affect how you respond to it basically. Yeah. Like I just, uh, I wrote this, um, the, the Sydney writers festival that I was just at, they asked us to write a letter to the future. Um, and, and mine was kind of about this and, uh, it was about this phrase that I just learned from a Filipino artist that, and then I talked to my mom about because she also speaks Tagalog and it's Bahala Na. And it means like, so the, the guy who told me about it, he, he translated it as like, fuck it. <laughs> like, it's just like, like, I'm not prepared. I'm going into a situation like, fuck it. Um, my mom's translation was, um, whatever happens, happens. Uh, -huh. uh and then, but this artist, um, he told me about uh, uh, this Filipino psychologist who had like looked like looked further into this phrase and like how do people actually use it in Manila? And his conclusion was that it was a positive response to uncertainty, and that mm. it was like it meant like it doesn't really conform to like our understanding of like either giving up or going forth. It's kind of like both because it's like it's basically being like I don't have control over the situation. But because I accept that, I can actually observe like what is here and I yeah. will bring all of my resources that I do have to the situation in like a highly improvisational and like engaged way uh -huh. by paying like super close attention. And he, and the psychologist was, he was arguing that that was like a uniquely Filipino thing because of, in part of having to live next to volcanoes and like in the middle of typhoons, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Look, the volcanoes are up there. I can't change that. But yeah. I, I can, I, I can like, I, I don't know, uh, come well, up it's with, like it's, you know. yeah, it's volatile, right? It's yeah. like, you have to be on your feet all the time. You can right. never sort of like rest, you know, or, or, or feel like you have control. Like it's so different from the kind of like, like the Western sort of like, I'm going to control this landscape kind of thing. Or like, yep. like the, the headline in um, that John McPhee book, the part about the San Gabriel mountains where there's like there's a newspaper headline that was like landslides declared unnecessary, <laughs> like that kind of like <laughs> hubris. Right? Um, right. So I don't know. I find like that. That's uh, I ended up writing my letter about that because it was kind of like, it's an attitude that's both. Um, it doesn't recede from the situation. Cause I think like either um, being, you know, blindly optimistic or just kind of resting in despair those are both kind of a way of pulling back from the actual details of a situation, like as it's unfolding right now. Yeah. Um, and it might overlook like really important details that are like very salient to what it's possible to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I sometimes, what, what was the phrase again? Say it again in Tagalog. Bahala na. Bahala it's, na. Yeah. What a, that's such a beautiful sentiment. And I find myself adopting that point of view sometimes where, I think a negative way that it's put in English is it it is what it is, you know, uh, which is that that people often hate to hate to hear that. Um, yeah. but that is a perspective I try to take sometimes of like, well, I I need to stop worrying about what should be, right? And say this is what is. 
And what yeah. do I do now right? in, right, in exactly response right. to it? Yeah. Yeah. Like it's very helpful if, if you can move on to that second question, right? It's yeah. like, it's like, okay, I accept this. Now what? It's the now what part, but you can't get to that part unless you, yeah, kind of stop hitting your head against the wall. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> it's like when people get mad at, at bad drivers, you know, uh, on the road <laughs> and I, and they're like, oh God, why don't people know how to drive? Well, guess what? There's going to be bad drivers. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. we're not going to, we're not going to get rid of those. Right. Yeah. So what are you going to do? <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah, like yeah. How, how do you, how do you respond to that? Um, how do you design a transportation system that's resilient mm -hmm. in the face of bad drivers? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. um, you, you could answer the same question about, about climate change. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty bad, <laughs> but yeah. you know, uh, instead of uh, we can, we can have space for grief about that too. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you have to, yeah. you have to, um, but there's always the opportunity to, to look at what is and say, okay, what am I going to do? That's going to be creative and improvisational and, and constructive in the face of that. Is that sort of the point? Yeah. And that you might surprise yourself. Like I, I always think about the, um, Rebecca Solnit's book, um, paradise built in hell, mm. which is about, uh, both man-made and natural disasters. In that book, she she talks to um, and researches, you know, uh, people who were responding in some way, like in yeah. the wake of a disaster. So like the 1906 earthquake or um, Katrina and like it, especially pushing against like kind of larger narratives in which people were portrayed as being very selfish or individualistic. And she finds not only that people were, you know, people stepped up, yeah. In ways that were surprising to themselves. Um, she, in some cases she finds that people were, are nostalgic. Like they'll, they'll say like, well, obviously it was this horrible disaster and there was this loss of life and like, that's traumatic, but, but it was also a time when they maybe met their neighbors for the first time and had a sense of purpose that was very unfamiliar to them. Yeah. You know, it's like, like, like you went off script or something. Yeah. You know? And I think there's, there's a really interesting kind of question in that book, which is like, how, how do you keep that window open um, and not have the impetus be disaster? Because I think yeah. you did see that during the pandemic as well, right? Like people, right. some people really stepped up and they did things that hadn't been done in ways that had, that they hadn't been done. And yeah. they, they made use of things that were not supposed to be used for those purposes, you know, right? Like things that were like even just building spaces, right? Like using yep. them for other things, right? Like people are very resourceful and there's a lot of creativity in that, even in the midst of something really terrible that involves a lot of grief. And I think being open to that, um, you know, is not just practically useful because it allows you to have those responses, but it's also like a really, really important source of hope. Yeah. Um, and believing that like people, believing that other people will, will do things like that and that you could do things like that. Yeah. I have a really personal example of that, which is that my, Union, the Writers Guild is on strike right now. And in the moments before we went on strike, you know, I was on the negotiating committee uh, the last couple of days of negotiations that started to look more and more like the companies were going to force us to go on strike. And we had been negotiating for weeks and it was all that it was months of work you know, uh, on my part and all, on all of our parts. You know, when I was like, I want to be doing stand up. I want to do some others. I want to travel. I don't want to do this right now, you know, and oh my God, they're going to make us go on strike and it's going to be so hard and people are going to lose work and we're going to be doing this for months and I just want it over. And I was really depressed about it. Uh, and then, you know, we had to call the strike because they made us do it. And then the, the first day of being on the picket line was so profound to see all these people suddenly come together to fight for their shared needs. Uh, and people had a lot of fear about it, but people also brought so much joy and it yeah. has continued to be so joyful for we're in our sixth week now, as we're recording this, um, people are still so joyful showing up to the picket line every day. And I'm starting to appreciate how much good is going to come out of this strike that, you know, people are, of forming community, people are getting to know their fellow writers in a way that they never did before. You know, the or earlier this week we had a, a Pride Day on the picket line. You know, and it was like here's all of our LGBTQ plus you know writers and and supporters showing up, and I as a straight guy get to come and participate. And that's so do so many other 
uh, writers and get, oh my God, like, yeah, this is part of our union too. And we have a shared struggle here. And that's going to lead to more understanding between people and the amount of good that is coming out of it that I could not have foreseen when we took that first step is enormous and more things are going to happen that I'm not expecting. And that sense of possibility that once you actually begin to fight, avenues will open up in front of you that you never even thought were possible before is so cool. And it's something that I'm that I'm trying to remember. Uh, it's a little bit similar to when you yeah. also, uh, another example of this is went on vacation a little while ago and I was so stressed out because I had so much work to do. And I was like, I don't want to go on vacation. I'm going to be stressed out the whole time. And I kept trying to remind myself when you're on vacation, yeah. <laughs> you'll feel differently because you won't be at work. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll you'll have a capacity for ex other uh, additional experiences that you don't have right now, you know, yeah. because you will be in a different place and you'll be experiencing something different. Um, totally. So I'm really resonating with everything you're saying. Yeah. And I mean, that's also I mean, that continues outward, too, because I feel like there I mean, I was in Australia and people knew about the writer's strike like they were excited about it. Wow. You know, and like. And it it like that. It matters for them, too. Right. It matters for people to see that. Yeah. Like, that it matters to see that like the joy and just like the, like these things that like no one could have predicted, you yeah. know, like not that long ago. Um, and it get like, it sort of puts the seed in someone else's head, right? They're like, Oh, well, like this is possible. Like maybe, like maybe I can also do this. And then they start talking to other people. Right. Like, yeah. So it's really like, um, I don't know. I have, I have this, like the unofficial motto of my book in the middle is that like time is not money. Time is beans. I have this whole thing about beans in the middle <laughs> of the book. What, what is this? Um, I, you have to expand. I'm sorry. What do you mean by this? Okay. So it's, time is it's beans. in the time is beans because, <laughs> um, no, I, I, um, I talk about being in a garden with my friend who's in her seventies and she was planting these beans that she told me are descended from beans that she got 20 years ago and she does not remember where she got them. And so uh. she, she thinks maybe home Depot. Um, this is like <laughs> decades ago. So she grew them at that time. She gave them to her friends, her friends ate them. Everyone agreed. These were so delicious and amazing. And they wanted more of them, but now they don't know where to get them. So her friends grew some of them to seed and gave them back to her. Wow. And then she gave them back to some, gave them to some other friends. They give them back to her. They give them to other people. So now she thinks that those beans exist all across the country. <laughs> um, and that, right. And like, and so, and she knew what I, I was working on the book at the time. So we were talking about it and we we're like, Oh yeah. Like that's like, it's kind of interesting how a bean has like both the past and the future in it. Right. Like oh. it's descended from this line of beans, mm -hmm. but it's also the potential for further beans. And I mentioned in the book that I like, I like Googled, um, can you, can you plant store-bought beans? And I was like, so shocked that you can, like, I was like, what, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like the, that they're not, they're not sort of like dead commodities. They're seeds. Um, yeah. They're seeds. And so, um, and so I, I, you know, she and I were talking about, you know, what if you think about time in a, in less than a zero sum transactional way where like, if I give you some of my, whatever abstract time cubes that I wake up with in the morning <laughs> and I have less and you have more now. Um, like what if instead of thinking that way, we thought about it more in terms of like these like seeds, right? Like something that you do for someone yeah. might like sort of bear fruit, like down the road, maybe decades later, maybe yep. very soon. Um, and it will continue to for a really long time. And I feel like kind of like what you just described is like, is that right? It's like, it starts from some, it starts from a moment. And then it that moment enables all of these other moments, and then that kind of like cascades, and it and it will ultimately change. I mean, like it is about work and about value and time. Like it will change people's experience of time. Yeah. Like on a lived level. Yeah. Well, how do we? Uh, man, I love talking to you because you have such a wonderful consciousness of all these other ways of of being, and it feels like at least talking to you that you are holding it in your head head and your being at all times. I'm sure you don't always feel that way, but uh, <laughs> how do you, do you have any suggestions for folks who like me are, get a little too productivity focused and a little bit too anxious about time, right? How do you suggest people go 
and you know participate in the sort of other forms of time that you're talking about. How do we how do we make our time more like beans on a day to day basis? <laughs> how do we be beans, Jenny? How do we be beans? <laughs> um, I um. I guess like two things come to mind. One is like, I think anything, and this is very similar to how to do nothing. I mean, like, I think anything you can do to become more attentive to these kind of like concrete things that are happening in time um, around you. Like I have a jeweler's loop that I carry around with me for looking at like moss or Mm. like very, I don't know, just very minute things. A little magnifying Um, glass. Yeah. uh, I think. I, I think just like maybe even more generally, just the capacity to be like surprised is yeah. is a really important kind of like antidote to that wish to control everything. Yeah. Um. So like this, yeah, this um, uh, awareness and attentiveness to like things that are changing outside of you um, is I think one way. I mean, you can't be there all the time. Right. But it, it I do feel like it kind of counterbalances that. Um, but I also think like maybe, I know this is very abstract, but like thinking in a less quantitative way, like um, I feel like at some point I switched from worrying about whether I was getting enough done in a day. Cause that's a quantitative question, right? Like did yeah. it, uh, that's a, that's like enough work um, enough, enough to do list items or something like that to like, did I have one meaningful experience that day? Mm. And if I did, then I count that as a success. Yeah. Cause I mean, and like, that sounds weird at first because I think like, you know, the to-do list is a very prominent way of thinking about a day's worth, Yeah. you know, but actually it makes complete sense. Like I, if you just like zoom all the way out, like all the way out, all the way out, like I'm, I'm someone who's friends with a surprising number of people in their seventies. Um, Mm. and I, and so like, I often am able to take their perspective on myself Yeah, where they're like, they see all of this time stretching out in front of me and they just want me to like, enjoy the time that I'm in, um, versus like, I see myself as like at the, at the, like the edge of something where I'm like always trying to do the best in that particular moment or something. Um, and so I think what, from their perspective and from that kind of like larger perspective of like, what do you want out of your life? Deciding to, to, you know, measure your day based on whether or not you had one meaningful experience actually makes a hundred percent sense. Right. It's very intuitive. Um, and then like, and just knowing that like, if you had that, then you can rest. And, and then ironically in that resting state, you I find that I often get more done, but that's not why I do it. Um, <laughs> right. You know, yeah. or, or like maybe I don't get more done, but it's like less painful. Cause I'm not doing, I don't have this, like this thing hovering over me all the time of like, are, are you going to get it done? And when you get it done, are you going to do other things? It's like, no, I, I, I did what I needed to do, which was like, have a moment where I was aware that I'm like alive on earth. So I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that really resonates with me, you know, in my, in my five-year journal, I, uh, especially when I started it, I used to list all the stuff that I did that day. I would go recorded a podcast, did all my emails, gave notes on this script, ba 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 And I'm like, I think I got a lot done today or whatever, you know? And then I would read yeah. back that the following year and be like, that's fucking sucks to read that. Why, do, why did I even write that down? That's what I do every day. <laughs> you yeah. Know? And I, I know like, yeah. yeah, I, I, I mean, this is ironic, but like I, um, I kept a work log for my book, mm. Mo- not because, not because I, uh, you know, like, um, not, not for the reasons that it sounds like basically I did it mostly because it was as a reference. Like I need to know like what day I was like reading this article or something. Uh-huh. Um, but it is this monstrous document because I would list things like, um, that wouldn't look like work to other people. Like I, I thought about X, you know, or something like that. Well, that's, that's good. Cool. That's work. Yeah. And that's the part of work. That's often hard to do when you're a creative person is, is actually do the thinking, you know, it's easy yeah. to, to collect and read and whatever, but then the actual new thought is like hard to fit in sometimes between all the emails. Yeah, totally. Right. And that if you're actually doing that kind of work, like, you know, that it just doesn't look that way to other people, but um, but when I got to the end, I actually, 
um, I can't look at that document. Uh. It's, it's, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, it's so, um, it makes me feel nauseous <laughs> to look at it. <laughs> and it's like, and actually I don't think it should be looked at. I think the product is the book, right? Yeah. Like the product is the book and the way that like, I think differently. And it's really interesting to compare that work log to, for example, my actual journal, mm. which does, which only has kind of like what I'm thinking about and like something that I like changed my mind about. Like, it's like a record of change, yeah. like kind of like, Oh, I'm this person now. Okay. Like yeah. I learned this, so now I'm this person, right? Like that reads as like a coherent, meaningful document. The yeah. work log is just like, is just like sublimely terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. What I, what I was going to say is what I've tried to work into my journal after reading enough of those horrible entries. Now I try to write down, like if I saw something beautiful or or surprising or shocking, or even just if me and my girlfriend laughed really hard at something that one yeah. of the other of us said, and I want to remember that phrase so that a year later I can yeah. be like, I oh, remember this like meaningless bit, you know, yeah. uh, that's because that is the stuff that I don't know, uh, makes life worth living. It's a cliche, but that is. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I, I think actually going by like, I, as some, I write about this in the book that I have had journals since I was old enough to write. And I, I have all of them, which I don't know if anyone should have all the journals, that they've written, but, um, but I, um, I, it means that I know a lot about what I want to read in the future. You know, like when you're writing down like, oh, what am I going to want to read in the future? And it is what you just described. Yeah. The thing that you want to read in the future is like the thing that you thought was funny. The like the weird thing that like a stranger said to you, um, like y like the something that you were really surprised by, like a moment of like wonderment, you know, like you don't really want to hear about. Like how you had so much stuff to do and you didn't don't feel like you have enough time to do it. Cause that, you, cause <laughs> that, that's all the time you yeah. always have that, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's like these kind of like the, the very easily overlooked kind of like textures of everyday life that you're so, um, you could so easily take for granted. Yeah. Um, and I think knowing that and looking back and seeing that that's important is really helpful for not taking it for granted in the moment. You know, I also have those journals from, I have journals that I kept when I was like 11 all the way through like early college. And then in my twenties, I didn't, I didn't keep any kind of journal and I regret it. And, and part of the reason is when I look back at those old journals, I'm like, sometimes I am like, this is boring. Like, I don't care about what I wrote here, but also I am looking at like, you know, a past version of myself dragged this pen across this paper and chose to write this stuff down. And I reveal things about myself that I did yeah. not realize I was revealing at the time. So even when I go, I'm sure 20 years from now, when I go back and look at the stuff that I wrote when I was really productivity crazed, where I'm just like, I didn't get enough done today. I'm like, wow, my past self was like really fucking obsessed <laughs> with work when I was, you know, 35 or whatever. Um, and I think even that, even that is valuable because it's what I really appreciate is not just, oh, what do I want to remember in the future? It's just the reason I love the five-year journal is I'm experiencing the change. You know, I'm looking back yeah. at it and saying, oh, here's how I was differently a year ago. Here's how I am now. And it's like I'm sort of observing my own internal clock. As you say, we have our own internal yeah. clocks and I'm I'm yeah. I'm witnessing it and it helps me experience time in a in a different way. So I, I guess just going out and looking for those other time scales and observing them and witnessing them and sort of being present for them is like a, a pretty good antidote it, it by itself. Yeah, I think, yeah, anything that can get you. I mean, I think when I think about like the, um, I, if I try to like uh, imaginatively put myself in the moment that feels the most like, you know, punishingly time is money, mm -hmm. um, like clock watching, it's typically very isolated, like in all, in all senses, right? Like I'm only thinking about me and how like I need to do this. And and I think yeah. frequently in that equation, you imagine that everyone else is just like <laughs> happily achieving their tasks. Like, right. Or like, they're, you, or they're you, going, why, why isn't Jenny getting us the thing we need? Yeah. That's all yeah, they're yeah, thinking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. And so like, you're kind of isolated in that. And then I'm typically not thinking about like where I am. I'm not thinking about what time of day it is, what, what time of year it is. Like, what historical moment I'm in, like none of those things, like it's extremely narrow. 
Yeah. And so I think that like, that's part of the reason why like any movement in that direction in any of those directions already, I think starts to loosen that up a little bit. Yeah. Like even just thinking about other people, just yeah. simply thinking about other people, right? Like thinking about like whose time like enabled you to experience your time or like um, thinking about like helping someone else or like just, I don't know, any, anything that kind of like breaks you out of that. Like I, I'm, it's me and the clock and we're like alone and I'm racing it. Yeah. Is, is helpful. That's just doing it with other people. You know, uh, that's part of what makes this try. I'm going to go to the picket line later today. And the reason I'm excited to go is because of the other people who I'll be doing it there with. We're all taking time out of our day to walk back and forth with the sign and no one's going like, I, oh, we need to get this done quicker. <laughs> all right. Yeah, the point exactly. is that we're going to, we're going to go do it every day as long as we have to. Uh, yeah. And, and on top of that too, I think like that's such a, I mean, I brought it up in one of the events that I was doing in Sydney as an example of, you know, like the limits of individual individualistic ways of thinking about time yeah. and not having enough time, not having control over your time. Like there's a, a woman that I uh, interviewed for the book. Who's the, uh, admin for a Facebook group for working moms. And we were talking about like time management specifically aimed at like working, working women. And she confirmed my suspicion that she as a reader felt insulted by that kind of advice and was like, mm. she was like, I personally think it would be more useful for me to get six other moms together. And each one of us would make dinner for everyone else one night of the week. Like oh. already she just intuitively sees past like this, Right. Uh, supposed path of like managing your time better. Like you can only get so far. Yeah. And those books never talk about your job. They never talk about why women being expected to do, do more. Like those structural yeah. things are usually not part of, of those books, which you know, I don't really blame them, but like, but that means that there's like a limit. Right. And I yeah. think that like the writer strike is just like a beautiful illustration of like that recognition where it's like, yeah. like, this like the worst case scenario is when everyone is very isolated and competitive and not talking about their experiences and how much they've been devalued. And yeah. then the best case scenario is when like everyone realizes that they have this in common and they realize like how much is possible if they do it together. Yeah. It's impossible to solve the problems that we're trying to solve on an individual basis with better use of by being more efficient or, or whatever we have or to being do like it. more, more employable. Like, yep. Yeah. Just, yeah, and, yeah, and everybody recognizes that even the even the mo people who are most successful at doing that, and yeah. we're, that's why we do it together. Uh, God, Jenny, we have to wrap it up. I I could talk to you for a thousand years. <laughs> Speaking of time, <laughs> uh, so I really hope you'll come back uh, and and be with us again. It's it's just always a delight talking to you. Um, the name of the book is Saving Time. People can pick it pick it up at our special bookshop, factuallypod.com slash books, uh, which uh, will not just support the show but also your local bookstore. Uh, Je Jenny, uh, where else can people find your work? Uh, I, Jenny Odell.com. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Oh, the internet age it's, it's upon us. Uh, yeah. Jenny, thank you so much for being here. I, I love having you. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, thank you once again to Jenny Odell for coming on the show and an especially big thank you to everyone who makes this show possible by supporting us on Patreon. I especially want to thank everyone who supports at the $15 a month level. Most recently at that level, I want to thank Nicholas Ratterman, Sagar Matre, Nick Frazier, Transient Astronomer, Ken Runner, and Rebecca Bayea. If you want to join them and support the show, head to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Once again, five bucks a month gets you every episode of this show ad free, and you can join our community discord. We even do a live book club over Zoom. It's so much fun. Hope to see you there. And of course, if you want to come see me do stand-up comedy, head to adamconover.net for tickets and tour dates. Thank you, as always, to Tony Wilson and Sam Roudman for producing the show with me and everybody here at HeadGum. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time on Factually. That was a HeadGum podcast.